The Treasure Well Up until the ripe old age of 16, most of the time I had been living with my grandmother in Minier, a small town in central Illinois, and now and then with my mother and stepfather in Peoria. I had planned to quit school after graduating the 8th grade, but at the beginning of the new year I moved to Peoria to live with my mother and two younger brothers. Mom would not hear of me not attending school, so I was enrolled in Manual High School, a large high school with over 4,000 students in a less desirable part of the city. Nothing like the little hometown school I had attended through my grade school years. Right off the bat, I was inducted into one of the gangs and managed to get stabbed right in the upper chest with an ice pick in a gang war. Not a serious injury, but it woke me up to what I was getting involved in. I managed to hide my injury from my family and played hooky from school, spending my daytime hours in a pool hall in downtown Peoria. Here I met a young man named Vance, who recently married and was planning to move to Arizona to live on a ranch with his uncle. Problem was, he had no transportation and no way to get there. Well, I was the proud owner of a 1949 Mercury and offered to drive them to Arizona in return for gas money and a place to stay when I got there. We left a few days later. A week or so later, we arrived in Glendale after what seemed like an endless trip. There were no freeways in those days and most of the trip was Route 66, then a two-lane road in various states of condition. Upon arriving at the ranch, which, by the way, was a half-finished small house several miles from town out in the desert of northern Glendale, nothing much to see in any direction except cactus, hills, and desert. No electricity, water, and little privacy. The interior stud walls had no paneling, and there were no windows, just screens in the openings to keep out the bugs. But I was made to feel welcome, and was awarded the covered screened-in front porch as my area where I could hang my hat. The porch was the total length of the house, and although completely open except for the roof, it was a really nice place to sleep after I got used to it. The nights were cool and serene, nothing like the hot days. It was great. During the day, not having a whole lot to do, we decided to hand dig a well thinking we might hit water not too far down, as we were only a few hundred yards from New River, a large dry wash that only had water running during hard rain. Since it was June in Arizona, with the sun beating down, the first thing we did was to build a shade over the well site. We also built a fence around the area since Arlene, Vance's wife, was a sleepwalker. We started digging and hauling the dirt up by hand in five gallon buckets using a rope. When we had dug down about ten feet, we constructed a hoist from a large wire spool mounted on a frame and proceeded to haul the bucket up with that. It was tough digging in a cramped space, but we continued on. About fifteen feet down, we ran into coleach, which is a very hard substance, almost as hard as cement. As we were chipping away at the stuff, shortly it became obvious that we were at a dead end. We decided to abandon the project, at least until we found our solution. One day, as we were exploring an old mine shack we had found, we discovered a couple of boxes of dynamite, along with blasting caps and a big roll of fuse just what we needed. Back to work on the hole. We would hand drill a hole with a star drill in the middle of the bottom of the well, about eight inches deep, and with a quarter stick of dynamite and a three minute fuse, blast away. It worked fine and we were able to get through that layer of coleage. One day as we were working on the well, an old prospector happened upon us. He was the classic bearded prospector walking with his mule with everything you can imagine packed on the critter. On observing what we were doing right off the bat, he said we would have to dig halfway to China to hit water around these parts. Didn't want to hear that, but he was probably right. We were already down about 50 feet and there were no signs of any moisture. 
Anyway, we decided to feed the old guy and after supper built a campfire. During our campfire conversations, he told us a story about a robbery of a Wells Fargo office in Tucson in the late 1800s. The five bandits getting away on horseback with close to $30,000 in $20 gold pieces. He was real interested to know if we knew of any old building ruins along the stage line which ran through this property. We knew about the stage line, but we didn't realize it was the Wells Fargo route that ran from Tucson to Prescott. Somewhere around this part of the desert, he said was supposed to be a relay station next to the stage line. The story was that the posse caught up with the bandits a few miles south of the relay station and in the ensuing gun battle killed two of the five robbers. The other three took off up the trail and got away. The two they killed were carrying their share of the loot, and that was recovered. The other three reputedly made it to the relay station and killed both men stationed there. With the posse not far behind, the three took off and were caught up with a couple miles past the relay station. Another gunfight ensued and all three were killed. Well, he says, they didn't have the gold on them. The old guy figured that they had buried the gold around the relay station after killing the occupants or had thrown it down the well next to the station. According to the old guy, it was never found. We were, of course, fascinated by the story. And a couple of days later, after he was long gone, we took off in Vance's uncle's 1944 army jeep up the stage line to search for the relay station. The stage line was cut deep, and a lot of the time it looked more like a wash than a road. In several places, it ran parallel as they had made a new route next to the old ones cut too deep to be usable. After a couple of days of looking, we got lucky, about six or seven miles up the way the line had split. It was difficult to tell as most of it had washed out over the years. By pure, dumb luck, we stumbled on the ruins of the old relay station. Sure enough, there was a well and a very old footing where the building had stood. The well had become so unstable and caved in that you couldn't really get close enough to see down the hole. After searching around for a while, we found what appeared to be two graves a short distance behind the ruins. Maybe there was something to that old prospector's story. We made plans to bring what we needed to excavate the well. Now, before you get excited and think we found untold riches, we were never able to come up with the needed expertise and equipment to excavate the well, and after living in the desert for a few months, we moved to Prescott. The ranch was abandoned and put up for sale. I shortly moved to Illinois and married. But don't think the tale of this well is over just yet. Many years later, after moving to Pace in Arizona, I met Clyde. Well, his nickname. His real name was Larry Foster. Clyde and I became close buddies, and I told him the story of the Wells Fargo robbery. The year was 1976. Clyde and I made plans to excavate the site. We packed up everything we could think of that we would need on his 1939 international truck and headed for the desert. What a trip that was. We were loaded down with all kinds of camping equipment, boards, plywood, a large wooden wire spool, food, water, and tools. After a long, shaky trip in Clyde's old truck packed to the gills, we finally arrived at the desert site west of Glendale. After exploring around a while, we proceeded to set up our camp. Unpacking and getting the camp set up turned out to be a two-day project, mainly because of exploring the Wells Fargo station site and the Indian burial grounds we discovered not too far to the south. Actually, our campsite turned out to be pretty cozy, though. Basically, it was just a haphazard shelter, as we really didn't have to worry about the rain. Our bedding was on the floor of our little building, which turned out to be quite comfortable. Early to bed and early to rise was the program. After finally getting organized, we proceeded to dig out an area on the sides of the well to construct a bridge across the top of it. Honestly, it was a really haphazard task. One slip and we were a goner. We took turns on this project. It was a dirty job. 
After digging out both sides of the well, we constructed our bridge across the well, where we could build it across the hole to set up our wire spool hoisting device. Not only was it for hauling up dirt and trash, but it was supposed to be our elevator to get up and down the well. Let me tell you, the first trip down that well, hanging on that rope with one foot in a five-gallon bucket, was quite the experience. To start with, there was a railroad tie caught across the well about 20 feet down that had to be hauled up with a rope to get it out of the way. Luckily, it was a small railroad tie, and it had pretty well dried out. We were able to pull it up easily. After getting the tie out of the way, I was lowered to the bottom of the well. I found out one thing. We had to use a different method to get up and down. So using a long heavy rope, we tied knots about every two feet, anchored it topside, and used that to shimmy up and down the hole. It worked fine, and it allowed both of us to be down at the same time without requiring another to get out. One day, when Clyde was removing loose rocks in the wall of the well, I heard a blood-curdling scream from the hole. He had uncovered a small rattlesnake behind a rock, and Clyde was deathly afraid of snakes. When I looked down the hole, he was plastered against the wall on the other side of the well, hollering at me to lower down the rifle, which I did. And after several shots holding the gun at an arm's length, with one hand, he completely missed the rattler. Climbing down the rope, I took the gun and shot the snake. Clyde was real leery about going down the well from then on. For the next several days, we dug down deeper through all sorts of trash and dirt, a lot of old hand-soldered tin cans and various objects that had been thrown in. There was no end to it. We never knew what we would find next. I can't help but wonder what this was about. I would imagine this was stuff thrown in after the station was abandoned. There were endless old tin cans, and the deeper we went, the older the junk was. If we're being honest here, some of it was actually pretty collectible, and we sold it at swap meets in Phoenix some months later. But back to the tale. A windstorm came up late in the day and made a mess of things. No rain, though. Just a lot of wind. Never rained once while we were out there. That would have been a good opportunity to bathe in the rain. And we really could have used it, as we took our much-needed bats very sparingly with a water jug. Not only did we work excavating the well, but also building the remains. In the corner of the building, we discovered an area we thought would be a place to hide valuables. The floor of the building was a thin layer of concrete, less than an inch thick, except an area in the corner about two feet. Digging down, we found the remains of a wooden box. We didn't find much there, though, except odds and ends of trash. Disappointing, to say the least. We thought we had hit the jackpot. We did happen upon an 1843 penny digging around the outside of the building foundation in an area we determined to be the front door. There was also another door which led out the back where we found vague remains of an outhouse. We also excavated that but only found more trash that had been thrown in. Nothing of any value. Then, of course, there were those two side-by-side -side mounds. Clyde wanted to dig them up and investigate, but all those years back when I had first found the place with Vance, I had determined them to be graves, and I wouldn't let him disturb them. A lot of time was spent digging and exploring the site and the surrounding area, but our main objective was the well, which we proceeded to dig even deeper. We seemed to be completely past the trash thrown in, only finding some random item every once in a while. Now, I should mention that both Clyde and I had been getting these feelings every once in a while while working the hole. The kind of feeling you get when you know you're not quite alone. We discussed this feeling frequently, and one night, after work, we decided to take a candle and go to the bottom and just sit quietly. It wasn't long until we scrambled up that rope. Maybe it was just our imagination, or just plain hysteria, but we both felt a strong spiritual presence. We never went down that well at night again.
The next evening, as night fell, we made a campfire and, after eating, spread out our sleeping bags and retired for the night. Sometime during the night, I was awakened by Clyde. When I finally came to, I realized he was no longer next to me. After searching, I found him to be right at the edge of the well. He was on his knees, crying and praying. He was hysterical, and by the time I could finally calm him down enough to tell me what was wrong, he told me that he had been awoken by voices, that they were taunting him and demanding he jump in. He then sort of spaced out for a second, and then he looked like he was going to jump. Fortunately, I was quick on my feet and I caught him. I was able to get him away from the edge of the well and bring him back to our sleeping bags, but I stayed awake the rest of the night to keep an eye on him. It was by that point the next morning we made the decision to pack and leave. Today, the site itself is underwater. Due to the Waddell Dam being built in the early 80s, holding back the waters of Hank Raymond Lake. The Wells Fargo station is forever lost. You can still find the old stage line below the dam though. Now before I leave you, I'll leave you with one final thought. Did we finish our excavation? Yes. Did we find what we were looking for? Perhaps one day that will be revealed.